So before we begin, I just want to say a couple of thank yous because it's been about 18 months of work. Um, the Bristol Foundation and the Bristol Holocaust and Genocide Center are our sponsors for this whole season's um, events. There'll be a film festival also in November that you'll hopefully hear about soon. And I want to thank Paul Jefferson and his team at IT for helping us in the, the places where we fail um, as far as technology, and Joe DeSaw and facilities, um, just to make sure that all of the details are carried out with ease. And finally, Laura Carlson. She was really, really helpful. Um, the Equity and Inclusion Subcommittee, who is tasked with Indigenous Peoples Day, are uh, Carlos, Carlos Almeida, sorry, Andrea Fortier, Marcio Garcia Rios, Farah Habib, Laura Hogan, Julia Jodwin, Nancy Lee Devane, Livia Newbert, Ron Weisberger, and Robin Worthington. And an extra thanks to Kristen Besner in Taunton for overseeing the event on that campus today. So um, I don't know if you know the book Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, but if you don't, you should read it. Um, she declares in her essay, Council of Pecans, that all flourishing is mutual. In my classes, I challenge my students to think about what that means. They recognize that the statement, all flourishing is mutual, is about interdependence. It's about the idea that if one of us is oppressed or silenced or somehow compromised, we are all a little less because of it which is how I think I came to this work many years ago when I learned in my 30s about the Indian residential schools, which existed for nearly an entire century in North America. It shifted something in me when I learned about those schools. They existed to kill the Indian and save the man, and the goal was assimilation, but the result was intergenerational trauma and sometimes death. There was no mention of these schools in the books I read growing up or the books given to me in my history classes. Before me, though, in my classes in New Mexico as a graduate student were teachers such as Acoma poet Simon Ortiz and Navajo poet Lucy Tapahanso, who spoke and sang in their native tongues testimony to a strength which we cannot fathom strength that their ancestors had to muster, to survive the schools, to embrace the language somewhere deep inside so it would not be forgotten. I've been on a journey ever since then to learn the truth from the source, native peoples themselves. I don't know about you, but I don't want a whitewashed history. As individuals and as a nation, not only can we handle the truth, without it we are living in a delusion. The shame and grief of a shared history of oppression of Native peoples is something we need to understand and process as a community. Without this reconciling, we will always be fractured and we will never flourish. Before you today and this season at Bristol Community College are Indigenous peoples from all over Turtle Island. You will meet several of them today when Ron Welburn and Lucille Langday share their poetry. And today and tomorrow when Marvin Lee Martinez gives his black on black pottery demonstration. You will have the opportunity to learn more in November when Wampanoag educators Linda Coombs and Anawan Whedon visit our concert, visit our campus for a film festival on November 9th. Another quote I love from Robin Wall Kimmerer is from her story Mother's Work about restoring a pond so her daughters can swim in it. In the story, she discovers that not until she is willing to step into the muck at the bottom of the pond and walk deeply into it, is she able to make any real progress. She puts it this way, transformation is not accomplished by tentative waiting at the edge. May you dive in today with your whole heart and may you listen and be transformed. I now turn you over to Judy, Judy Urquhart, our Chief Development Officer. Good topic. 
Tar Stacy. Muni ma tan pen ni ton pak ka na na ton kosak. Na tasu is Judy ka na week on Tom Wuchi Kanipiamu Bristol at kat na ton takamak. Good morning my friends and relations. I just welcomed you in Wampanoag to Wampanoag, the language of the Wampanoag Tribal Nation of Massachusetts. A language that had gone silent over 150 years ago, but that is now, thankfully, experiencing a reawakening. As Stacy said, my name is Judy Urquhart, and I'm the Chief Development Officer here at Bristol. And on behalf of President Laura Douglas and the entire leadership team, I'm delighted and proud to welcome you to the first ever Indigenous Peoples Day event here at Bristol Community College. As Stacy said, over the next three days, you'll be treated to the work of Native American historians, artisans, poets, and musicians who will share with you the history and culture of indigenous people here on Turtle Island, what is now known as the United States. Before we delve into today's activities, it's important to acknowledge and recognize, as Stacy said, <laughs> that the college sits on the traditional homelands of the Wampanoag Nation, who has lived here in southeastern Massachusetts, including the Cape and Islands, for over 12,000 years. In fact, the name of our very state, Massachusetts, uh, is a Wampanoag word, meaning at the place of the big hill, and we believe it refers to the Blue Hills in Boston. In addition to the four remaining Wampanoag tribal communities uh, who are located in Mashpee, Aquina, Asanit, and Herring Pond, we can also see the influence of Wampanoag language all around us in our cities and our towns like Mattapoiset, Seekonk, Akushnet, Cahasset, Nanaquaket, and Situit, all of which are original Wampanoag place names. A big thank you to the Indigenous Peoples Day Planning Committee for their hard work in putting this event together with a special thank you to Stacy Charbonneau Hess, our committee chairwoman. So Katapatash Stacy. Katapatanamu, Wachi, Piomu, Yukisakak. Thank you for coming today and we hope you enjoy this special event. Thank you. <laughs> I'd now like to introduce Farah Habib. Thanks, Farah. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is already starting out to be such a, a magical event to hear all this about the history of the language and uh, to hear the land acknowledgement <coughs> read out loud for the first time. Um, thank you, Stacy, for your leadership. Um, <coughs> Ron Welburn is the author of seven books of poetry, including Council Decisions, Selected Poems, Revised and Expanded Edition, he received graduate degrees from Arizona and NYU, now an emer emeritus professor in the English department at UMass Amherst. He formerly chaired the Five College Native Studies Committee, co-founded the university's Native and Indigenous Studies program in 1997, and served as director of his department's graduate concentration in American Studies. Ron Welburn is an Akamak Cherokee descendant from the Ginga Skin Reservation on the Virginia Eastern Shore, other tribes in the Chesapeake Basin, Len Lenape and African Americans. Um, and I also have the honor to uh, introduce our other poet. Lucien Lang Day is the author of four poetry chapbooks and seven full-length poetry collections, including Birds of San Pancho and other poems of place and becoming an ancestor. Her many honors include the Blue Light Poetry Prize, two Josephine Miles, Penn Oakland Literary Awards, the Joseph Henry Jackson Award in Literature, and 11 Pushcart nominations. Lucille uh, received her MA in English an MFA in Creative Writing at San Francisco State University, and a BA in Biological Sciences, a Master's in Zoology, and a PhD in Science Mathematics Education at the University of California, Berkeley. She is of Wampanoag, British, and Swiss German descendants. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thank you. 
Wuni Kisuk, good day. Um, I'll start out by saying kuda pudish. I thank you um, to Farah Habib uh, and Stacy Charbonneau Chess Hess for organizing this event, and kuda pudish to Bristol Community College for hosting this event, and kuda pudish to everyone joining us here, uh, both live and on Zoom. So um, I'm really thrilled and honored to be here um, giving a poetry reading in my ancestral homeland. Uh, I'm going to be reading from three of my books, and I'm going to start uh, from, by reading a poem from my anthology, Red Indian Road West, Native American Poetry from California. I co-edited this anthology with Lakota poet Kurt Schweigman. So I'll read one of my poems from this anthology. Uh, this is called At Lake Tahoe. Granite mountains, dense with white firs, lodgepole pines, and ponderosas, rise abruptly from the lake's blue bowl, so deep its waters could cover all of California and Nevada. The Washoes, who lived here 10,000 summers, named it lake in the sky because it reflected clouds, sunset, and stars. They caught Lahontan trout in the lake, mountain whitefish in icy streams. On the other side of the continent, my Wampanoag ancestors were gathering cranberries, covering their summer homes with cattail mats, baking clams, drying corn, and fishing for salmon off Cape Cod. The Washoes used only fallen trees for homes they would dismantle before leaving Lake in the Sky each winter. In fall, they gathered pinion pine nuts to eat until spring. This was before white people came and cut down the pinion pines to build their houses, dynamited the mountains, dynamited the mountains in search of silver and gold and claimed the fish. Now a paddle boat with three decks takes tourists on cruises of Lake Tahoe. Yet in summer, Washoe still do the pine nut dance and Wampanoags do the grass dance to keep the world in balance and remind us that the earth is living. Every rock is sacred and every tree and salmon has a soul. And next, um, I'll read a few poems from my collection, Becoming an Ancestor. This is one of my poetry collections. Um, uh, my mother didn't tell me until I was in my 20s uh, that her maternal grandfather was Wampanoag, yet somehow I intuited that as something that she was Native American all my life. And this is a poem about this. It's called, I Always Knew It. I knew it at four when I ran for the creek every chance I got, and my uncle called me the wild Indian as I slid down the bank, then leapt from stone to stone to reach the other side. I knew it when my parents threatened to give me back to the Indians if I didn't behave. I didn't care. I wanted to meet the Indians. I knew it as I rooted for them in all the old westerns and lamented when they lost and were cast as the bad guys again and again. I knew it when my Native American studies teacher said, I think you're an Indian. And when my aunt told my mother, tell her the truth, tell her what she wants to hear. I knew it at 23 as I stood at a dusty crossroad on the Rosebud Reservation. It was stamped on my mother's high cheekbones and woven in her dark hair. It was clear as the difference between flat redwood needles and the scales of a giant sequoia. Clear as the difference between the musical chirps of Wilson's warbler and the soft hoarse whistle of Brewer's blackbird. I could feel the people of the first light stirring inside me with each contraction of act actin and myosin fibers in all my muscles, with each nerve impulse 
as sodium rushed into my neurons and potassium rushed out, I knew it all along. I knew it before I could prove it with a DNA test. Long before I'd heard of Wampanoags, I always knew it by the stick-like body of the Thule Bluet, the silence of the lynx chasing rabbits for food, the silvery needles of Sitka spruce, and the yodel-like laugh of the common loon. I knew it was true. So uh, my mother was estranged from her Wampanoag family, but after her death, I decided I wanted to meet the Wampanoags. So I first reached out to the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, and I called them and said I wanted to visit. Um, and they said, fine. And when I arrived, the first thing anyone said to me was, welcome home. And so this is a poem about that. Welcome home to Mashpee, where snapping turtles and painted turtles bask on logs in the marsh amid water willows and ferns and pickerel weed with purple flowers reaching up from the shallows. Welcome home to the place where your great-grandfather whispered to trout he caught at Santuit Pond, then sat in a circle and offered his pipe to earth, sky, and the four directions. Welcome home to the coast where your ancestors built Wituash and gathered cranberries, to the woods where they hunted turkey, deer, and bear and to the clearings clad in goldenrods and asters, where they danced for 10,000 years. Welcome home. The, ancestors, the elders have been waiting for you. Listen to their drums, the beat of your own heart. Take this wampum necklace made from the sacred shell of the Quahog clam. When you wear it, walk through redroot and wild lupin. Hear the quickening rhythm of the field sparrow's song. So um, although I was welcome to Mashpee, I met on that trip, I met with um, a Mashpee Wampanoag historian and told him my family story. And he said, your great grandfather must have been a Picasso Wampanoag. And so um, my true home is right here. My true ancestral home is right here in Fall River, uh, the land of the Picasso Wampanoags. Um, and also, it's um, not only the home of my Pocasset great-grandfather, but also of his partner, Anjanette Sampson, whose family homestead was in Fall River. So um, this one, the next poem is called Instructions for a Wampanoag Clam Bake. Wade into Papanesset Bay and collect some rock people, old round stones smoothed by the tide. Remember Moshup, the giant who predicted the arrival of white men. When he said goodbye to the people of the first light, he turned into a whale. Find a place in forest shade, make a circle and dig a shallow round hole for the stones. Moshup's friend, the giant frog, came to the cliffs and wept, changed into a rock. He still sits at Gayhead today and looks out to sea. Before finding dry wood for the fire, your gift from the forest, notice the shape of the hole and the stones. All life is a circle. When the tide is low, gather quahog and sickasog clams and plenty of rockweed whose stipes are loaded with brine. Light a fire over the stones and when the rock people start to glow, pile rockweed on them. This is their blanket. As salt water is released from the stipes and steam rises, add clams, lobsters, corn, more armfuls of rockweed. This is the Apinog, seafood cooking. Now thank Katanit, who saw the frog's sorrow and turned him into a rock out of pity, and taught the people to, to use the earth, plants, animals, and water to care for themselves after Moshup left. The deer will always make you laugh. The mountain lion take your side. The star people shine on your path if you do it this way. And um, I'll conclude with um, 
some poems from my latest poetry collection, um, Birds of San Pancho and Other Poems of Place. And the first one that I will read is called Behind the Scenes at the Museum, and this takes place at the uh, Science Museum of Minnesota in St. Paul. A science museum, big as a factory, as much underground as above, wide white basement hallways, fabrication rooms, stored collections, a giant door leads to a gallery of room-sized vaults where temperature, humidity, and light are controlled. In one, shelves hold jars of creatures floating in fixative. Shrimp, crabs, mice, fetal mountain goats. Another has drawers of insects, a huge butterfly with blue iridescent wings, a stick bug one foot long from South America. A whole vault for dinosaur bones, another where a bison skeleton has been assembled then blessed by tribal elders. More treasures. A fossil tortoise 350,000 years old. A bald eagle, its white tail and brown wings spread in a drawer. Earrings of shiny green beetle wings and a necklace of small birds from Peru. From the plains, beaded moccasins and dresses, samples of corn, miniature ears, red or brown, more than 100 years old. More nutritious and tasty, the curator says, than corn today. Some corn now exists only here, but the museum is planting seeds to give the corn back to the tribes who gave it to early anthropologists who couldn't give them back their land, but at least thought to save the sacred corn. So I think it's great that the anthropologists saved that corn, um, but the truth is, is that some of these other objects held by museums, and I don't know about the Museum of Science of Minnesota, but things like sometimes things like those beaded moccasins and dresses that they have were obtained not legally through trade or purchase, but were actually stolen. They were stolen from people massacred, and they were, they were taken from graves. And, it's, um, and uh, so many of those items should be given back as well as the corn. Um, next, I'm going to read an environmental poem called What Flows Into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the environment is of great importance to indigenous people worldwide, so I wanted to include um, an environmental poem. In fact, the land is sacred to indigenous people worldwide. Melted snow from the crests of the Rockies rushes past pinion pines, limber pines, lodgepole pines, cork bark firs, ponderosas, gathering silt as it reaches bur oaks, cottonwoods, staghorn sumacs, silver maples, passes prairie cordgrass, winds through cattails, duckweed, skunk cabbage, finally to mingle in the Mississippi with water draining from 31 states where hunter-gatherers lived with bison herds for 10,000 years. Now the river carries oven cleaner, human feces and caffeine, medical residue from hospitals and laboratories, scouring powder and soap from millions of houses, antibodies from all the cattle ranches in the Midwest, solvents from farm machinery plants, pesticides from corn and soybean fields, ingredients used to make plastic, enough estrogen from, the bir from birth control pills to bend the genders of fish. Thousands of tons of herbicides, fertilizers that cause algae to form a massive green carpet in the Gulf, which leads to an explosion of bacteria that decompose algae and kill everything in an area the size of Massachusetts each year. All this, even before 206 million gallons of oil from the deep water horizon blowout, before hundreds of thousands of gallons of oil dispersant containing chemicals that destroy red blood cells and cause cancer, 
it all enters the shimmering translucent bodies of arrowworms and dinoflagellates consumed by oysters, the algae scooped up and eaten by shrimp. The crabs that crush mollusks and shrimp with their chelipeds, the sea bass whose stout jaws clamp down on any smaller creature. Of course, it's in our blood and hair and fingernails. It floats in our hearts and permeates our brains as surely as hope or anger. It's in your body and mine, these molecules that cling like lovers to our bones. And traditionally, indigenous peoples have been much better stewards of the land than the industrial societies. And I think that, uh, that we have a lot to learn from the uh, indigenous wisdom concerning land stewardship. And I will conclude um, with a poem called Names of the States. Alabama for the Alabama tribe, forced from Alabama to Texas when white people claimed their land in 1805. Alaska for the Aleut word Alyeska, meaning mainland, the place toward which the sea flows. Arizona, the word for small spring in the Oedam language of a southwest desert people who couldn't vote until 1948. Arkansas, another name for the Quapaws, the downstream people who were removed to Oklahoma from their ancestral lands. Connecticut, from the Algonquian word for long river place. Delaware, from Baron de la War, Virginia's first governor, whose name rechristened the local Lenny Lenape, the first tribe to sign a treaty with the U.S. Hawaii for Hawaii Loa, discoverer of the islands in Polynesian myth. Idaho, maybe Shoshone for the sun comes down the mountain or the Apache name for the Comanches who drove them from the southern plains. Illinois, a French transliteration of Alinwi, the Ojibwe word for the Anoka, whose 13 tribes were reduced to five by European disease. Indi Indiana, land of the Indians, the Delaware, Piankashaw, Kickapoo, Wea, Shawnee, Miami, and Potawatomi, who were mostly removed by 1846. Iowa, from the D Dakota word named for the Iowa tribe, meaning sleepy ones. Kansas, the Dakota word for the South Wind people, whose last fluent speaker of the Kansa language died in 1983. Kentucky, derived from the Iroquoian word for on the meadow. Massachusetts, people of the Great Hills, that is, the Blue Hills south of Boston Harbor, who were decimated by smallpox in 1633. Michigan, from Michigan Ma'a, great water in the language of the Ojibwe, who like so many others, didn't understand the treaties ceding their land. Minnesota, from Minnesota, the name the Dakotas gave the Minnesota River, whose clear blue water reflected clouds. Mississippi, from Mississippi, Ojibwe, for the great river along which more than 20 tribes lived and fished. Missouri, for the Missouri tribe that lived on the Missouri River, a Siouan people whose name means town of the big canoes. Nebraska, from Nebraska, the Omaha word for broad water, a description of the Platte River by which the tribe lived. New Mexico, named for the Mexicas, an Nahuatl speaking people who ruled the Aztec Empire until the Spanish conquered them in 1519. North and South Dakota, named for a Sioux tribe whose men were sentenced in 1862 to the largest mass execution in U.S. history, though Dakota means friend. Ohio, 
from Ohio, continuously giving river in the language of the Senecas, whose land was flooded in 1965 following construction of Kinzua Dam. Oklahoma, from Oklahoma, Choctaw, for brave people, a name proposed by the chief of the Choctaw Nation during treaty negotiations in 1866. Oregon, maybe from Oregon, an Algonquian word for beautiful river, but so many native words and languages have been lost that it's hard to say. Tennessee, for the Cherokee town Tennessee, a village on the little Tennessee River until the Cherokees were marched to Oklahoma along the Trail of Tears. Texas, meaning friends or allies in the language of the Caddo's, who were removed to Oklahoma in 1859. Utah, from Utahai, an Apache word meaning people of the mountains. Wisconsin, from Wisconsin, the name for the Wisconsin River in the Miami language, river running through a red place. Wyoming, a contraction of Mechi Wyoming, a Delaware word first used for a valley in Pennsylvania, meaning at the Big Plains. And yes, every part of this land is Indian country, from forest to desert, mountain to prairie, Manhattan to Yosemite, Tallahassee to Seattle, all the fields, rivers, hills, and canyons between the two shining seas. So, kuda uh, to everyone. Again, it's, it's been wonderful to read here today. Hold on. Want to see? They say getting old is not for sissies. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, thank you, Lucille. You know, this is the first time that Lucille and I met face to face. We were part of the AWP uh, Poets uh, in Place conference uh, at the AWP conference back in, when was that, March? And um, I was able to do mine sort of, I guess you could call it virtual. I had to tape it mine first and send it to Philadelphia. Well, send it to her and it was shown in Philadelphia. I grew up in the Philadelphia and Philadelphia's Southeastern Pennsylvania is full of a lot of Delaware names and, and uh, Lenape names like King Sessing. And when you mentioned um, Gingiskin, you know, Helen Roundtree, who is supposedly the authority on Southeastern um, Cherokees and South Indians in southern part of uh, the, the uh, Delmarva Peninsula, she didn't know where it comes from. I think it comes from or it's similar to the word King Sessing, which means a meadow place, and that King Sessing area in Philadelphia, in southwest, in the sort of the upper part of southwest Philadelphia, is a slope, and it's a very meadow, mellow. I used to drive right through that going to high school, down to Bartram High School, every day for three years, so I think I know a little bit about that. Anyhow, um, thank you all for attending. I'm going to try to read, um, sorry we're getting started on Indian time, but I'm also... <laughs> I can't, I'll have to throw this in. We watch a program called uh, Laughing Samoans, and in one of the, sequen one of the sequences, they, they, these two guys are dressed up, and they are talking to kids, and they say, um, island time, boys and girls, island time, and it's supposed to be the, the equivalent, you know. But anyhow, uh, let's see here. I'm going to start with a poem that um, I sent to uh, the to uh, Stacy, it's called uh, "Seeing in the Dark." At UMass, there was a, you know, I'm not a person who just sticks with the with the faculty. Who there was a guy who um, his name was Francis, and he worked in food services. And I got to know him. I used to go into to uh, have lunch and spoke with him a lot. He was of Nipmuc and Nauset background, and uh, he knew that land. Oh boy, he knew the land. Anyway, uh, I wrote with this poem with him in mind and also with my dad in mind. 
It's called Seeing in the Dark. Blind at night in the forest, you are right about fear and what it does to you there. How fluids and adrenaline fix the eyes or what on, fix the eyes on what the mind cannot accept. And this explains it all. How when they came here, the thick forest unnerved them. How they couldn't find each other in the pursuit of some theory of white. How is it that Grandmother Moon's face is impen impenetrable, disembodied, inchoate, in spite of narratives launched to be deviled by poetics? How they started a legacy against trees and brown people. And you are right again about that fear, right as rain and morning and frost on the pumpkin, waiting in the dark. For why should we fear when we are the he <clears throat> for why should we fear when we are the bear, the fisher, deer, and vile? Even the owl is our community. Okay. Owls, uh, you know, some people, native people, have concerns about owls bed symbols and so forth. Anywho, uh, this is a poem about music. Tomorrow I'll be up at uh, Attleboro giving a program about jazz, so I think I'll offer you this one. It's called An Eagle Alights on the Bandstand. An eagle alights on the bandstand and disappears through the tubing of coronets, a series of owls from the forest to the stockades on my bass clarinet. Elk voice assures my trombone, and every crow and every jay, every pheasant cock and raven play my saxophones. With this, I offer you an intertribal. Let's see. We used to sell, my wife and I used to sell books for several years at the Power House, and uh, there was I'm not going to. I'm not going to give you the punchline because it's in the in the poem. I call the poem it, the bibliophilist for interior decorators. Call upon our booth at the next powwow, won't you? We have the printed word designed to make the leaves speak in the archaic tongues of your of your wallpaper, poems and rituals from the solar plexus in the at the. Poems and rituals from the solar plexus of the mechanical age. Buy them now. CD-ROM may only populate or pollute a mental screen. Try to recall what you said. Books are so decorative. They carry what you are willing to tell you, what you really need to know about cultural taste. Couldn't believe it. And then she said, you know, she was looking at the covers of the books, and she said, oh, books are so decorative. My golly, can't you do better than buy a book? We're crying out loud, you know. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, okay. In this poem called uh, Someone's Face, one of the central images of my grandmother, who used to, when I, we were young, going to drag us off to the holiness church that she was belonged to at one time. And um, considering her background, uh, I wrote this poem. Someone's face, like the body of an upright bass, cannot speak, in, cannot speak its complete inner life or its legacy of hard stands, fight, and stomp dancing. Faces belie origins. Dance steps relate what in the homes, what in the bones even... Uh, I need the other pair of glasses, <laughs> if that'll help. Sorry. I just had cataract surgery. It's not too bad. I thought they were going to stick a needle in my eye, but they don't. <laughs> and it was over in 15 minutes, but the waiting, I mean, you got to wait till two hours before you can get to anything. Anyhow. Sorry for this delay. Okay, page one. All right, I'll start it again. 
someone's face like the body of an upright bass, cannot speak its complete inner life or its legacy of hard sounds, fright, flights, and stomp dancing. Faces belie origins. Dance steps relate what in the bones even the heart may not remember. On the sanctified floor of the, at the level of the L, Nana shuffle danced in the spirit of the Holy Ghost. Escanye Genese, you are like Onondaga and Seneca women but she spoke no tongue of face of or and origin. This was what it meant to be an American, forced from home, hiding out generations in the Blue Mountains, assimilating Westchester, Pennsylvania with red clay and oaken faces, Piscataway and Lenape traces. My mother enjoyed Jimmy Lunsford, Basie, and Louis Jordan, and smiles in her stomp dance steps. No other part of the world can raise your feet or your, no other part of the world can raise your feet or mend your heart this way. No other origin, despite your, pre, your protest, makes you feel right at, makes you feel right as a moccasin. No tambourine, no, jeez, no tambourine holiness completes turtle rattle and the circle of drums like this. Okay. This is called Turtle Dreaming. No, I'm going to read this one to the good old boys who gloat they had, that they have defeated us. Can the land be, can the land be healed that's been stolen, Theft, thefts sta sanctified under the, under the icon of the cross? Can the land at this protracted crossroad redeem those pillagers, the good old boys who plow the, fle the fields and the few good men in their concrete towers? Gloating about conquest reveals them. Gloating their cowboy serenades to genocide, their commandments bowed down before fantasy, pages ripped from the Gideon Bibles in motel rooms of indulgence. Good Christians all, who must answer to their children someday about land theft and murder and pride in making the world safe for America? The deer ticks, the deer ticks would now fight for us. See their circle imprints on the, the limbs on the bellies of, the, of children, of the conquerors, and the conquered too. The invitation to dream. The angry winds, funnel clouds that knows no fear. The pupil slits like a, in a jaguar's face, looking in the eye of the world. American victories always come sugar-coated. Taste of blood for the industry and advertising to hearts numb with the narcotic of progress. That's from a collection called Counts of Decisions. It's a uh, reprint and an expansion of a, my fifth volume. That came out uh, 2015, I think it was. Okay, let me read a couple of others here. Um, I like playing with language. I think a lot of poets like to do that. You start to, you know, sort of swirl. It's like having a taste of something in your mouth and swirling it around and see what parts of it you can, you know, if you eat a, whether it's a chocolate bar or even, even if you're eating a piece of venison, you're going to taste something that's a little different from what the rest of it is in your mouth. And I like to do that every once in a while. This is called the field's aromatic. The breezeless trees and the fields aromatic in the bright mornings, buoy the spirit of how lovely the colors of desire smell and how, and how fragrant is the idea of peace held in the hearts of light. No greed and no blues, no job blues, no minguses, no private income dues. The trees and the fields aromatic there in front of the wild breezes projected smells of desire. How lovely the fragrant uh, the fragrant notion of peace held in the hearts of light and the turbulent shadows of interiors. The still flowers of trees and the fields aromatically fuchsia and thistle and smiling beneath the red winds buoy the spirit mist of dawning slopes and the close fragrance of strawberries and wet honeysuckle and the inevitable return.
Here's a no. Oh, okay. You know the oh. years ago, um, many years ago, I w I was at a um, I was a member of a, a group of people who were selected by the Music Critics Association and the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, to be part of a jazz critics um, symposium, 10-day symposium. And um, there was a young fellow there by the, who, who came up from the Smithsonian. His name is J.R. Taylor. And he asked me if I was, he said, are you Holly West? I said, no, I'm not Holly West. He said, you sure do look like Holly West. I said, well, if his name is Holly West, my uh, mother's mother was by, you know, Holly West. When I finally met this guy, he was like looking into a mirror. Okay, um, I think you know where I'm going with this. Uh, and he told me he didn't see he was he was a writer for the Washington Post. He lived as an African American. He was darn near full blood Cherokee, I guess. He said he told me that his people went to Arkansas. It's possible that um, see my grandmother's grandfather, uh, who was the son of a marriage between a Cherokee family, a group of Cherokee families that moved from the mountains east to the Delmarva and married into the Genghiskin Reservation. And the Genghiskins are the Akamak people, and they are cousins to the people up here, Algonquians. And um, in fact, the twins, the guys, the Edmonds brothers and Linda Mitchell, I think were related because of the ways that intermarriages took place. Anyhow. This is a poem called The Lookalike. The guy thinking you were me had peered into my eyes asking, are you Holly West? And what could I say? And when did I meet you? And when I did meet you, what else could I say? Long lost Cherokee brother, cousins, I suppose. Make it a marquee sign, the dividing of the West, and we'll sell tickets. I propose we start our own legacy in this absence of mountain to memory that turned us into jazz men and brown-skinned buckaroos. Knowing what I know, our faces are two top shell plates on this turtle island. There is no mistake, Arkansas or Virginia, there simply is no mistake. All right, I think I've got time for, all right. We traveled many years with uh, Madge Barnes Allen. Her father was a going back Cherokee from Tahlequah, born in 1867, and her mother was from Shinnecock, one of the Enos family. And uh, let me know, by the way, somebody, if I'm going over time, just yell. <laughs> it's called Scudded Sky Evening. Sea fisherman's blood courses her veins, pumping that strong heart that knows how scudded skies will seek tomorrow longer than the dew. Beauty alone designs this sunset. The water above us roams muted as in gold and orange and odd wonderful shades of lavender and blue. Scallop clouds, shell row upon shell row. She knows them. We see her make the, with them a mantle of heaven to wear, dancing, stomp dancing around the fire that evening. Scallop clouds, clouds with secret colors, shells and hands held beneath the mantle of the evening. Never deny this design would doubt the heart whose ancestry, whose ancestry lost in the storm off Quag, moves on the water intimate with the gale winds. Madge's uh, great uncles were lost in this Circassian accident in 1870. There were about six of them that, that men had died, the Enuses and Lees. Okay, I think I'll read one more. Um, it's funny, sometimes you get things set up. All right, this is a lover's poem called A Gift. In the pulse of the drum and the circle, I saw your smiling half profile, your braids wrapped in ermine skin. Your dress was the morning sky, holding fast at the drenched trees next to the foaming sea. 
subtle beads trimmed you, all white fringed for shawl dancing and for moments of, of scrubbing. I cannot explain why my whimsy to this patience in knowing your pride. Your figure still is gift to your lover, his woman, serene, your man. Hold on. Thank you. I'm going to shamelessly hawk the books. Uh, and by the way, uh, I have a book by a friend. Uh, his name is George Price. He's a, a, a descendant of the Easton family that lived in this general area back in the uh, 19th century. His name is George Price, and he lives, and he, he's retired now from teaching at the University of Montana. But he has a whole, it's a book about this size. I've got it. And it's, oops, I'm sorry. It's a legacy book. And any of you who are interested in buying it, I have it say, I have one copy. So, you know, that's that. Um, I guess now, what, we go for Q&A? Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, no, 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 I can pay. I think so. <laughs> All right. I have to eat my words sometimes. I tell them I'm from Pennsylvania. We don't do feeble in my family. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. Well, we were, um, what a gift to have Lucy and Ron here today to kick off our season of uh, celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day, and we're going to do it all year round um, from here on in. So I just wanted to read a, a comment. Um, we in Attleboro really love the relationship with nature in the poetry. It is like cool water for those who are thirsty. Thank you. Um, that's our friends in Attleboro. And anyone here? We have about Five minutes or so. Any questions for Lucy or Ron? I actually had one. Um, I was thinking about, uh, Lucille, how you are in California and you um, are a Wampanoag descendant. And I'm wondering, actually for both of you, how you stay in touch with your indigenous communities. Um, like here, you know, you can go to a powwow uh, for the Narragansett tribe. I went this summer, it was beautiful. Um, there was a, a powwow in Dartmouth a couple of weekends ago. And I just wondered how, how you two stay in touch um, with your communities, so. Uh, yes, well, I visit uh, Mashpee whenever um, I get, go to Cape Cod, as I've, I have other family members on Cape Cod too. Um, uh, in, uh, including my husband's sister and her daughter. Uh, so, um, yeah, I've been to the Mashpee uh, Wampanoag powwow. I've been to the, the Mashpee uh, Wampanoag Museum. Um, I recently uh, published a broadside. I wish I could have brought some with me of my poem, Names of the States. And I worked w on that with um, a Mashpee Wampanoag design company called Smoke Signals. Um, and uh, Steve Peters uh, co coordinated that, uh, who's a member of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. And that was really good. And it was good, you know, just communicating w with him about and working on the design of, the, of this broadside and the, uh, the, cr the explanation of the credits. and. Um, there's a, 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 the design of the broadside uh, includes a, a Wampanoag, well, a, a, a wampum bracelet, and it's held now by the Peabody Museum, and, you know, and we decided to, uh, you know, acknowledge that this, that this, this wampum bracelet, but not to mention the Peabody Museum, um, because they might be holding it illegally. So any, anyhow, and then I'm also in touch by email with um, three members of the, um, the Pocasset Wampanoag tribe of the Poconoke Nation. Thank you. Um, among the ways that I've been uh, doing this, I guess, much of my, my life is just 
trying to make sure, staying in touch with family members, and especially the older family members who, who professed knowing the family's history. And even, let's say, uh, on dad's side, my grandmother, you know, you, when you speak about um, the, uh, the schools, boarding schools, well, Chester County, Pennsylvania is about three counties east. And every once in a while, my grandmother would go through the house because we, I grew up in that house, and she'd talk about, and she'd go on a tear and a rip, and a, talking about people coming into homes taking children away. Well, she was born in 1894, so this is something that she, it was a carried on tradition. And yet at the same time, she would deny, she would deny that she was Indian, she would deny she was Negro, she said, I'm American. And it, you know, you learn these code words, and sometimes it takes a, a while. Um, when I went to various places, and uh, let's say to South Jersey, for example, where there is the, uh, there was an old Lenape community that was joined by the Nanticokes, and so it's now known as the Nanticoke uh, Lenape, Lenai Lenape community or tribe of southern New Jersey. And Mark Gould, who was in one of his tenures as tribal chief there, this is about 40, 40, 40, 43 years ago. And I was trying to find the greys in my family. He said he didn't think there were any greys among the nanny cokes, but he showed me some, some people. Anyway, uh, I, my nana used to go to South Jersey. She'd get my dad to drag her over to South Jersey, go over there to the community. Never said anything about being Indian. And so fast forward into, let's say, about 1979 or 80, and I'm asking about you know some of the, the families and the old, he, he said, I'm going to introduce you to some of the elders, the elder ladies. He walked over to, to the elder ladies and said, who you, you say you are? Oh, we know who you are. You know, like that. And I mean, that gives you a kind of a, assurance. We grew up in a household in West Philadelphia and also in Berwyn, Pennsylvania, in Chester County, where it was, um, well, my mother said something to me that was disturbing. She said, nobody, when she was a child in the 18, 1920s and 30s, Nobody wanted to be an Indian because she, everybody thought Indians were mean. That's what she said. I said, well, you know, for crying out loud, but that's what she said. The proudest moment that I had when I was 14 years old, 1958, was when the, the Lumbees ran the Ku Klux Klan out of the cornfield. And that was, it made the newspaper. Boy, it made me feel great. Uh, you know, you, you, we move into, I mean, I kept going down to Virginia, uh, the Eastern Shore, the old area of the reservation, which was never formally uh, disbanded, never formally disorganized, or, or, you know. And um, Charlotte Collins was alive then. She was the clan mother for the Fox clan. She lived on the territory. She said no one else was interested, it seemed. I guess I was the only one. That's a heck of a burden in a way, but I've tried. She wanted me to try to find people who had been run or the families that had been run off that reservation after the Nat Turner Rebellion, 1831, in the late part of the year after the, because that took place in about August, I think, over on the Tidewater. The white people forced a massive sell-off of the, res the reservation homes. They were in allotments. Now, I've, and it's in writing that they didn't want any Indians or free Negroes on the Eastern Shore. I'm saying to myself, well, why, why Indians? Why free Negroes? Um, it may shock some people. I don't know. I haven't nailed it down yet, but it's possible that Nat Turner was an Indian. You know? Uh, so, I mean, there, there are those kinds of things that go on. Um, and the sea... Uh, the people of, you know, the tribal members who were still active, they had a bulletin board of where there were photos. I recognized people in the photos. It was Bob Stevenson, Bob Redfeather, and a bunch of other people. And somebody came in, a new director of the, res of the uh, recreation center, and threw it away. Threw away. I mean, it's a legacy. So um, now the whole business of trying to reconstruct all of that is tremendous. And uh, that's kind of how it's been with me, making these kinds of connections, possible, possible Seneca connections through 
family legacies, Cooks and Jamesons from Seneca country. But, you know, a lot of people don't remember it and don't want to talk about it. This is one of the reasons why in my poems I try to get this information out there in a poetic way and also to talk with members of the family and talk with other people too. So that's how, you know, that's... Uh, yeah. It's been a rocky slope. In, 19, in the early 90s when I got there, um, I found myself, and you know, not reluctantly, as a part of the um, steering committee for the certificate program. And we established it in 1997. It's really in its 25th year now. I was the director for nine years. I couldn't get rid of the job, you know. It's one of those kinds of things. I said, look, you know, it was in the anthropology department. It's a certificate program, which means it's not a minor. It, you get, it's so, it functions something like a minor. And it's um, when we established also the um, five college uh, certificate program, uh, so that was about 2010. I don't know, things kind of went on a level area. And I think that uh, actually the folks out at uh, the Institute, the Native American Studies Institute, UMass Boston, which is ably run by Cedric Wood, who's Lumbee, and also it was a part of the dream of um, Maurice Fox uh, to have an institute like that. But, you know, I'm hoping that we can revive this and move it into the area where we have a major and something else. Uh, we were doing very well, even though, I mean, I, <laughs> I, I didn't know a thing about fundraising, you know, and Bob Painter and Joyce Benson and I, we really were trying to put our heads together on that. And it was a lot harder, I think, at that time. Today, well, I mean, geez, Bard College just got this huge $25 million uh, f grant, two of them, for Native Studies and Native Students, you know, recently, last week. And, uh, you know, things going on. I, we've been kind of overshadowed, I think, and it's kind of sad, you know. Um, but we're still going, and I think that uh, the possibilities are I, I see a sort of a rewind, not a rewind, but a winding up of things and moving into a next area. We could have had the major in 2011. I think we were sandbagged. I don't know exactly why, but uh, because all because there were a couple of people who came from outside, you know, we have a re an evaluation. And uh, they told the, the, I guess the people on the campus that we didn't have this, that, or the other. It was right there. I don't know what happened. I don't know. So that's that story. So we, it's kind of like casting the net again. And this time we're going to ho hopefully drag in some big ones. <laughs> So thanks again to Dean and James, our interpreters, and to Julie for arranging that, um, and to Lucy and Ron. And we, you're welcome to hang out and take a look at the books, um, which are available for purchase outside in the hallway. And we'll see you soon this week at one of the other events. Take care. Okay, bye-bye.